Well, good morning, everyone. So it's been a been a little while, but we'll try to try to keep trucking along in our study on the history of the church. So we spent the last several classes going over some doctrinal developments that were going on post Renaissance era, where we had some things like the doctrines of purgatory and transubstantiation really starting to develop at this at that time. And of course, these were all things that were going to start leading in to some of the causes of the Reformation. So as we get into this lesson, we'll talk about some of the things that are starting to progress towards that Reformation you start seeing really kick into high gear during the days of Martin Luther. So the Reformation, while attributed by many to be started with Martin Luther, it actually began generations before him. Like we've talked about in this class several times, nothing in history happens very quickly. It all is slow progressions over time that finally lead up to the straw that breaks the camel's back, which would have basically, we could attribute that to Luther and his nailing of the 95 theses to the door of that cathedral there. But we had seen in some of our previous lessons, there in what would generally be termed loosely as Christianity, uh, there was some unrest starting to develop. And so we'll look at some of these things now. If we go back to the early mid-11th century to the East and West Evolving Fellowship, where you have the Eastern Church break away from the Roman Catholic Church, a division which is still alive and well today. Um, so we have the Lord's Church. It was the same from the beginning in Acts 2.38, or Acts 2, excuse me, all the way to today. The Lord's church has not changed one bit. Mankind has changed, but the same church that was established on Pentecost is the same church that exists today. We just need to make sure that we're a part of that one. But even early in the first century, um, or as early as the first century, we can read about this in the New Testament of issues they were dealing with, we start seeing departures arising. You know, how does Paul open up the book to the letter to the church of Galatia? I marvel that you're so soon removed from the gospel that was preached to you. And I go in after another gospel, it's not a gospel at all. So we see these departures begin as early as the first century. Uh, we don't really see the formalization of the Roman Catholic Church till about the early seventh century, although many of their doctrines and dogmas we start seeing very early on come on. And then 1054, you have the Great Schism, where the formal breaking of the Eastern Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, whatever term you want to use, and the Roman Catholic Church. So the Renaissance really changed things in Europe. Um, this awakening, it brought about a lot of things that renewed exploration, discovery, trade, um, this really aided with the Renaissance. There was a lot of changes in other things like banking. The spread of capitalism started arising at this time. There was a renewal of science and industry and learning. Um, the literature and art that was produced in this period, rise of universities. Uh, there was a lot of aspects that took place in the Renaissance which really paved the way for the restoration, or excuse me, the Reformation movement and then two or three hundred years later, the Restoration Movement. And we'll talk about this quite a bit, and I'll keep repeating this. Reformation is not restoration. They are two very different things. And we'll talk about this, Lord willing, some in our class this morning, because many of the people who were starting this were not trying to restore the New Testament church and start adhering to what was taught in the Bible. They were trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. There was parts that they didn't like, and so they didn't want to throw the baby out the bathwater, so we just want to get rid of the parts we don't like, and, you know, because it's a man-made religion, so why not? Do what you want with it. There was also a lot of individualism that started developing, um, produced another great result in this learning. It brought about a renewed vigor. Uh, there was a lot more uh, zeal and self-assertion with these things. All of these factors came to bear upon the beginning of the Reformation movement. So, and this was very true, especially when we look at those early uprisings against the Roman Catholic Church. So, in this lesson, we're going to talk about um, 
these earliest efforts and some pre-Reformation figures. Uh, we'll get into later lessons where we'll deal with more prominent ones like Luther and Zwingli and so forth and Calvin, those, those individuals. But these, we'll be dealing with some lesser known ones in this lesson and then Lord willing next week we'll get into some of the other individuals, some you may have heard of like Wycliffe and others you may not have heard of. Again, I'm always going to reiterate this. Reformation is not restoration. Now, the notable reformers were not trying to leave the Roman Catholic Church. And that's, that's really important to understand. They were not trying to create a new denomination. They were trying to fix the problems with a man-made religion with man-made solutions. They were not going back to the Word of God to try to get it. You know, people that were trying to deal with this, and we'll talk about a couple groups here this morning, they, were, they saw some issues that was going on in the Roman Catholic Church, and they were trying to correct those issues because they were not what they liked. Uh, some of them were just really bad, and others were not so bad, but people didn't like them. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's in opposition to the Restoration Movement. Whenever you think of figures like the Campbells or the Stone, Barton Stone um, and other individuals that were involved in the Restoration, they initially weren't trying to start a new denomination. They were all just looking at their Bible and studying like, hey, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't say anything about this. Uh, notably, the issue of infant baptism was a big one. They all started, really started standing out to them that they... Like, the Bible didn't teach this. And initially, you had them, I think a lot of them were Presbyterian. They would go into their respective churches, and they would teach truth. Not full truth. We probably still wouldn't allow them up in our pulpit. But they were, they were getting on the right track. And as a result, they were basically excommunicated, for lack of a better term. They were kicked out, disbarred, whatever it is, when you remove someone's ordination. And so, okay, we're going to start our own, where we're going to preach we're going to stick to the Bible. And that famous saying of let the Bible, let, let's speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible silence. Or even a better one by an apostle Peter, if anyone speak, let him speak of the utterance of God. You know, and that's just, that's what we should all do. If the Bible's silent, God doesn't give utterances on it, then we probably shouldn't be spending a lot of time on it. We need to stick to what the Word of God says. And that's what these restoration people we're trying to do. What does the Word of God say? Okay, that's what we're going to teach. So, like, okay, we're going to gather a group together, and that's what we're going to do. That is not what the Reformers were trying to do. They wanted to stay in the Catholic Church, but they ended up, denominations started spreading and forming because of their teachings. Again, they were not trying to restore the New Testament pattern, they're trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. So let's look at a couple of reforms that take place within. One of the important things for us to consider is that, you know, there are these, some of these efforts, we've alluded to them previously. Um, like I said, this did not start with Martin Luther. This goes back a long ways with these reforms. And we can go back to the middle of the 10th century, actually, with some of these. There were two, two specifically great misuses that became, that they were trying to reform. And they, these became lightning rods, so to speak, for, for um, these abuses. One of them was monasticism, and the other was practice of simony. So monasticism, this was a very important institution during the Middle Ages. So many believe this was the highest form of Christian service and sacrifices. If we go back to an earlier lesson some months ago, whenever we were during the period of time where it was still illegal to be a Christian, it was viewed by many at that time, um, and probably based off a of passage that Christ said, that greater love hath no man but to lay down his life for his friend, it was viewed as the greatest form of Christian service and sacrifice to give your life for Christ, to be martyred for Christ, for that cause. Um, as time went on, and when Constantine legalized Christianity, and 
persecution of Christians was no longer widely practiced. It was more isolated at that time, especially in Europe. They had to start going to something else to be the highest form of sacrifice and service. And this started to be the asceticism, the self-denial of everything. The people who went out and lived as hermits and uh, lived off the grid, so to speak. And this started forming and, and evolving to being the monks and nuns who lived in the monasteries and nunneries. And this was becoming the highest form of Christian service and sacrifice one could do. However, by the Middle Ages, monasteries started falling into disrepute. Many were entering them for worldly gain and honor, and so the discipline really declined. A latterette makes this observation. The reports tell of widespread lethargy, luxury, laxity, and even stark immorality. And many monasteries' poor financial management had brought evil days. Some others, heavily endowed after years of earnest living, became vacant or all but vacant, and their revenues went to support of the absentee and often worldly ecclesiastics. Nunneries were the favorite places in which to domicile younger daughters of the aristocracy who were not provided with husbands. In them, the scions of nobility, having no inner call to cloistered life, they disregarded the rules, went off, off went abroad, and had private incomes which made possible physical comforts. We read, too, of monasteries which were refuges for the sons of nobility and monks who were lazy and spent much of their time in the chase and frequency in taverns and in frivolous and obscene talk who were, who were aver avarice. So you had a situation where these monasteries and nunneries were no longer these places of a so-called higher calling of religion. It'd be places like, well, if you all... With your girls, well, we got the first couple married off, but we can't find someone to marry these other two off. We're going to stick them in here. And that's what it was becoming. Uh, same thing with sons and that sort of thing. Like yes, a little bit. Well, yeah, they're kind of a wild one here, so maybe we'll stick them over here, and they'll be good influences on them. And you know, we all know those stories, how those go. I've known several preachers' children and elders' children who've gotten expelled from Christian colleges. So it's not a place to send them. It's a place to – I'll be quiet on that, my opinions on it. Anyway, but it's, it's, it's similar, stuff like that. And I'm, something I was thinking about when I was going through this earlier, you still had devout young men and women who were raised in a very religious atmosphere, you know, and – if they're going to this kind of stuff, we can have the debate on whether it was godly and biblical Christianity or just worldly Christianity. But you, you would have people like this, and it would be very demoralizing to them to show up and thinking that it's going to be one thing and getting another like this. Now, I, I was thinking about this when I went in the Army. Of course, it was well after the draft had ended. It was all volunteer Army. And so... I had the naive view that people were like me. They all had the same thoughts as me. They had a lot of patriarch. They really wanted to be there. They were, you know, for whatever reason was, it's somewhere they wanted to be at, and they were gladly volunteering to do it. That lasted all of a couple hours. And then I realized there was a lot of people did not want to be there. They'd been forced into it by whatever, for whatever reason. Um, I guess it was a better option than going to jail type of situation. You know, there were a lot of people that, you know, they were they were, did not want to be there, and they made it clear they didn't want to be there, and it just demoralized everyone around them. Um, and it would be the same situation in something like this. You have a young man or woman who is very devout in their beliefs that's going to these situations and all of a sudden, you have these very worldly and wicked people that have corrupted whatever the original thought and view on it was and turn people off religion altogether. And it, it really does. And stuff like that happens today. You know, we can easily be the cause of someone of being, you know, sort of interested in God to completely rejecting God. Uh, we see this in the Catholic Church all the time today, especially with the child sex abuse and how many people have that completely turned away from religion and ruined opportunities to teach them the Word of God. So 
a lot of a lot of the way we behave can have what much wider impacts, and certainly this would have been the case at this time too. So you'd have laymen who would often perpetuate these monasteries for their own personal gain. They would turn it into some type of business opportunity for themselves. There were several attempts to, to purify these. Um, the Cluniac reform was the most notable. In the uh, 10th century, you had Duke William the Pious of some name in France that went to Cluny, Monastery Cluny in Eastern France. It was interesting even though this fell in the Roman Catholic Church, they were free from papal interference on it. And they even had papal protection of it. It had its own governing power. And uh, Shaft described it, daily life was regulated in all details. Silence was imposed for the greater part of the day, during the, which the monks communicated only by signs, strict obedience ruled within, hospitality and benevolence were freely exercised to the poor and the strangers who usually exceeded the number of monks. So it's very interesting the opposite way is going, and we still see monasteries in modern times like this where they don't talk, they don't speak during the day. Uh, they basically only they, they talk in their chants and singing and that sort of thing. Everything else is strict vow silence. Then they were now expected to be laborers and as ascetics, the demands were stricter. But this reform was just one within the Roman Catholic Church, and it did not actually produce a reaction against Catholicism. So the second of the two objects we'll talk about this morning was the practice of simony. Um, by the late Middle Ages, you start seeing the papacy declining from its height and, um, and idealism, I guess, to becoming, becoming a more political body instead of a religious body. In the 11th century, there were enemies that drove Pope Benedict IX out of Rome, and Sylvester III was placed in his stead. Um, Benedict IX then sold his office to Gregory VI, but then refused to step aside. So you had a time in the mid-11th century where there were three men that declared they were the canonical pope. Um, this was one example of the simony being practiced. Um, it's interesting on this aspect, too, where you have three men all being the, the vicar of Christ on earth, all claiming the same office, all claiming to be the descendant, the spiritual descendant of Peter. Um, so, again, you even had times where the Roman Catholic Church didn't know who the actual person was that was supposed to be the spiritual descendant of Peter. So, simony, what is it? Well, we get the name simony from Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, the man who tried to purchase the gift of the Holy Spirit from the apostles. Um, so this term is applied to the purchase of ecclesiastical and episcopal powers. This became a very lucrative, popular practice during the Middle Ages. And you can understand when we think about the power that came with being in the episcopate. Um, being a priest and the power you held over the layman. Um, we talked about this in one of our previous lessons when we started talking about indulgences and purgatory, and the priest had the power to say someone was going to go to heaven or hell. And to get that power over people would be a very lucrative thing indeed. There were two notable popes who were responsible for starting to try to get rid of this practice is Leo the Ninth and Gregory the Seventh. Uh, Leo the Ninth, yeah, Ninth, appointed Hildebrand, who became Gregory the Seventh, to the cardinal colleges, and they they tried to exterminate this practice. Um, but we want to remember too, this reform movement also stayed within the Roman Catholic Church. This was not an external one. Then we start getting some of these reactionary reforms. So these are ones that are reformations that took place as a reaction to issues going on. Uh, there are two specific groups that we'll look at in this. The Albigenses, maybe, how you pronounce it, and the Waldenses. So according to Qualbin, there were many spurious elements that have been introduced in the church government, doctrine, discipline, and worship. 
spurious asceticism, work righteousness, lax and demoralizing discipline, secularism in the church, and other abuses had made heavy inroads in the church. So it was no surprise that you'd start having groups arise that seek the purification movements against the Catholic Church. We see this today, even in the Brotherhood, where congregations will split. They don't, a group doesn't like whatever practice is going on in this church. Um, they view it as being either too conservative or too liberal. So a lot of times the, the liberal branches, we don't like it, you're too conservative, we're going to go over here and do what we want to do. The conservative branches say, you are a bunch of flaming libs over here. You all have no, are not Christians. We're going to go over here, and we're going to do it the right way. So we, we've witnessed these in our lifetime. Congregations have had these pro problems for one group, from one group or another. Um, but there were such groups at this time seeking to get away from the Roman Catholic Church, which, as we talked about in our lesson on Inquisition, was not an easy thing to do. The Roman Catholic Church, for all intents and purposes, was the the ruling government in Europe, especially Western Europe, um, the Pope being its, its uh, monarch, and to leave the Roman Catholic Church was treason, and they were treated as such. So the Albigenses were the most unorthodox of these groups. Um, they were also known as Cathari. Uh, it's terms given to them because of the strong home, a stronghold um, of the group was in a town named Albi. In doctrine, the Cathari were very much like the Manchaeans that we talked about way back in one of our first couple lessons. So they believed in a doctrine of two gods, a dualism, and they renounced all material things as being evil. Does this ring a bell on anything? Gnosticism. These are Gnostic, Gnostic beliefs. They believed that God had two sons, Christ and Santanel, which later rebelled and became the leader of evil. So in this belief system, they believed that Satan was the son of God also. Again, very close to Gnostic theories. They renounced the seven sacraments, especially any physical elements of the sacraments. So I would assume that these would be things like baptism, uh, the Lord's Supper, our physical elements. Um, I don't know any of the rest of them would fall into the physical elements, but they rejected all of them. They also made great use of the Bible, but they didn't accept certain books. Uh, this is very much like a lot of other reformers. Um, we'll pick on Martin Luther. Luther rejects the books of James because of its emphasis on faith. And he was rejecting that because he did not like the faith, the faith, uh, the faith uh, teaching in there that you had to, or excuse me, not faith, sorry, works. He did not like that aspect of it, and part of it was because of the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church of the works working your way to heaven, especially things of the selling and buying of indulgences, um, but. He rejects the book of James because James teaches what? Faith without works is dead. So if your works are wrong, well, I can't have that book then. So it's similar to this group. Um, I couldn't find any specifics on which books they did not accept, but they did hold strongly to the Gospel of John because of its great spirituality. And the Gospel of John is very different than the other three Gospels, too. There was actually a crusade instituted by the Roman Catholic Church against this group twice in the late 12th century and then another by Pope Innocent III. So this was actually one of the causes of the beginning of the Inquisition um, against the so-called heretics. They were ones teaching that was different than what the Roman Catholics accepted dogma. And so this was one of the causes of the Inquisition where it really, really started to get some steam up to squash down any heretics. Again, you crush the rebellion and the treasonous people and then get everybody else to fall in line when you make an example out of them. 
And that's the tactics that were used by the Roman Catholic Church. You make an example out of someone, and the next group will be, will be hesitant to move forward and do anything. But in the stride of this, um, this claimed a large number of followers. So the Waldenses, the next group we'll talk about this morning, uh, began the ma in the Middle Ages, and it derives its name from a man named Peter Waldo. He died sometime early 13th century. We don't know very much about him, but he was a rich merchant in the city of Lyon and in France, and he became deeply aroused to religious life. Religious life. It goes, history states, tradition states, whatever. Um, he went to a priest, asked his advice, and the priest told him, sell all, in order to be perfect, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Very reminiscent of Jesus talking to the rich young ruler. The difference is that was the son of God who could see what the rich young ruler specifically was standing between him and heaven versus some uninspired man sees a wealthy guy. Now, you need to get rid of all that stuff. Maybe it was good advice. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But we, it kind of made me think, we got to be careful the advice we give people. You know, Christ can tell someone, this is what you need to do specifically because he could see the heart of the, that man and know one thing you're lacking. You know, you ever think about that? That was divine commentary on that man's life that there was one thing that he had misplaced in his life and that one thing was going to keep him out of heaven. Christ was able to do that. I can't look at anybody in this room and it's like, all right, you got to go do this. Like, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe it's good advice. Maybe it's really bad advice. You know, we don't we don't know that. So we just got to be careful of the advice we give. Because um, sometimes I can think I'm giving Matt good advice, and Matt might think, yeah, that's a good idea. And it turned out to be a really bad idea. You know, so. Well, I don't think so. So other people might, but I don't think so. But Walden followed this advice. Uh, he did, Waldo followed this advice. He did not actually begin his movement in opposition to the Catholic Church. This is a very interesting one. At the Third Lateran Council at the end of the 12th century, um, his group, they went and petitioned the Pope that for him and his group to be able to preach. They were laymen. Well, we can't have that. You guys are too dumb to do it. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't been properly educated. And so their request was denied because they were deemed to be simply ignorant laymen. This is another problem we get into in the Lord's Church, that if someone doesn't have that piece of paper saying they've gotten for training from somewhere, we're not going to let them preach here. And I, I've known of, Carrie and I have known of one guy specifically that he didn't need to go to preaching school. But he basically said, I won't be able to get a job if I don't go. I want to be a preacher. I won't be able to get a job if I don't go. So he went, and it didn't hurt him to go. You know, he went to, um, I don't know what it's called now. It used to be East Tennessee School of Preaching in Knoxville. It's called something else now, Southeast Biblical Studies or something. And, you know, it didn't hurt him to go. It was good for him to go. But he understood that if I want to get a job as a preacher and actually be able to afford to eat food, I'm going to have to go there. And that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, somebody wants to preach and they're preaching truth, we need to let them preach. And they need to be encouraged to. You know, some people are better at it than others, but some people are just, they're, they they want have the desire, they have the knowledge. We just need to grin and bear it sometimes and let them preach. Um, but this caused a problem. The Roman Catholic Church said, no, you haven't been through the proper channels to be able to be allowed to do this. So upon this refusal, his followers ignored it, and in defiance they, of the demands, they went out and they preached. Whatever they preached, I don't know. Um, they were then excommunicated by the Pope. So it's thought that they probably would not have left the Catholic Church if they had not been excommunicated. 
you know, the Catholic Church basically kicked them out. Like, no, we don't want you here because you're out preaching when we didn't give you permission to. Following the statement by the apostles in Acts chapter 4, it's better to obey God rather than men, we must obey God rather than men, they felt the same way. They believed it was more important to follow God than to obey man. So they began to go preach on their own. So their preaching program involved five specific things. The church must return to the pure teaching of Scripture. This is almost very restoration-like, but not quite there yet. But they believed, you know, we got to go with what the Bible says, not all these other things. Yes, very much so. And they weren't so rebellious that they were rejecting all of Catholicism either. They were still holding to some of it, but they weren't so rebellious they were rejecting all of it. Whereas you get the later Restorationists, they were basically rejecting everything. Once they saw this was wrong, they started looking even harder, like, well, this is wrong too, and this is wrong too, and this is wrong too. So, uh, a biggie was they did not believe in purgatory. So that was very much heretical teaching to teach there was no purgatory. The church is not infallible is what they were teaching. I'm assuming they're re referencing the Roman Catholic Church in this um, because the, the Lord's church is infallible, you know, now, we can screw it up. We can screw up things in this building, but that doesn't impact what the Lord established. So. No. No, and that was cause for um, imprisonment, punishments, and that sort of thing. Christian laymen are entitled to preach. Absolutely. If you're preaching truth, have at it. Selling one's good and giving the proceeds to the poor is an act of Christian consecration. So, that's not wrong to do that. Barnabas did that, but is it required that we do that? Uh, this idea that, <clears throat> that, you know, it's wrong to have wealth is not found in Scripture. Now, there are certain passages, Paul talks about this, to Timothy and 2 Timothy, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. You know, it's not the money itself that's evil, it's the love of it. And then we even see um, what Jesus says in response to the rich young ruler walking away, talking about how hard it is for a wealthy person to go into heaven, to enter paradise. Doesn't mean that a wealthy person cannot. Abraham was very wealthy. You know, we don't, say, we don't find anything in Scripture that would lead us to believe that he is in hell. We find an exact opposite. You know, we go to Luke 16, the rich man Lazarus, when the rich man opened his eyes in torment across the great chasm, he saw Abraham in paradise with Lazarus. So we see the exact opposite. So we know from Scripture, it's not sinful to have wealth, but it can get in our way between God and our relationship with God very easily. You know, it is in what Christ's statement, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 18. You have everything on earth, what do you got to look forward to? It's hard to convince someone that has everything that there's something better ahead. That's one of the reasons why you generally have so much more success in third world countries in preaching the gospel of Christ than you do in, say, Hot Springs, Arkansas, where everyone, even, even our poorest people here, live like kings compared to other people in this world and historically speaking. Um, so, so this preaching of selling, you had to sell all this and give the poor, you know, that's, that's not quite in line with Scripture. Uh, some of their beliefs were, in accordance with the New Testament, they went about two by two to go out. Uh, they only wore very simple clothing, sometimes not even shoes, and they only lived based off the gifts that people gave them. 
and then they fasted three days a week. They rejected oaths and all shedding of blood. Now we see modern denominations still holding to this type of thing. Jehovah's Witnesses is one of these. Uh, they use no prayers but the Lord's and a form of grace at the table. So this is problematic because we see other examples outside of Jesus, um, prayer and model prayer and and Matthew 6 and, and in Luke, um, I think Luke 6. But we also see his prayer in John 17. So those are great ones to model ourselves after and pray. But we also see in other books of the New Testament a couple of examples of prayers that they did in the, in the early church there. So, you know, is it wrong to use those? Those were inspired, some of them spoken by apostles. Wouldn't necessarily be wrong to use them. Wouldn't necessarily be right just to be quoting them verbatim. You know, again, that gets us into this issue of the, you know, just the saying words, you know, the Hail Mary type of prayers. Hail Mary, Mother Grace, Hail Mary, Mother Grace, Hail Mary, Mother Grace. You know, it just becomes repetitive nonsense that means absolutely nothing. So, um, they heard confessions. It's not wrong to hear confessions from people, but there isn't a specific time or a specific person we have to go to to confess something if we're having an issue. It's perfectly fine to go down in the front pew during the invitation song and confess whatever issue it is and ask for prayers to the church at that point. It's just as valid for me to go to one of my brethren and confess the same thing. You know, they observed the Lord's Supper together. They ordained their members as a ministry. Again, there's that issue of ordination. Uh, there's no specific thing in Scripture given that a man has to do to be up and preach. They rejected masses and prayers for the dead, and they denied purgatory as unbiblical. And we should agree with every bit of that statement. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with a funeral or having a celebration of someone's life and that sort of thing. But these masses for the dead, these prayers for the dead are pointless. Um, and purgatory absolutely is unscriptural, as we talked about in one of our previous lessons. They held the sacraments invalid if they were dispensed by unworthy priests. What makes someone unworthy? If someone baptized me that was living a double life that we didn't know about, does that make my baptism any less valid? No. If I'm doing something out in the world that's very sinful, does that make me handing you all the unleavened bread or the fruit of the vine, does that make that invalid for you all? No. I got a problem, but that's not your all. That's not, that's not going to affect you all. So that's, that's a problem when a random person, oh, they have, they're in this situation, so nothing they have done has, has counted them. They believe prayer in secret more effective than in church. I disagree with this. I don't think anyone's better than the other. There's a time and place for public prayer. There's a time and place for private prayer, and we should have both equally. For example, not in here this morning, but I'll pick on him anyway. Bill, being an elder in the Lord's church, is privy to information that he can't share publicly. So, when he's in his private prayer life, if he knows a specific situation that's going on, he can pray for those specific people to God. When he's up in the public, it would not be appropriate to do that. And so, he could still pray for them. God will know the difference. God will know what's going on even though us in the auditorium in listening and in his and praying along with him may not know the specific situation he's talking about. So there's, it's not more effective to pray publicly than it is pray secretly. There it is both good and both needed. We need to have a public prayer life. We need to have a private prayer life. They defended lay preaching by men and women. So a little bit of a problem there. Um, you know, however, 
there are certain instances where a woman could preach. My mom talks about a congregation out in rural Boone County, West Virginia, and that's out in the middle of nowhere, so rural Boone County is way out there. That only had women there. And my dad would go there to preach every once in a while, so when he'd go there, he'd have to do everything. He'd lead singing, do all the prayers, do the Lord's Supper, and the preaching and teaching. If he wasn't there, who was going to get up and preach? Were the ladies just going to sit there in silence and stare at the walls? So there can be certain circumstances where a woman could do it if there was no Christian men to get up, because there's no Christian men to get up and teach and preach. They can't be usurping the authority from any Christian men. But I'm going to take a wild shot in the dark and say that's not the situation that they were defending here. Uh, it's very denominational um, theology to women to be able to be in leadership roles in various denominations. They had bishops, priests, deacons, and a head or rector of a society. Well, we have bishops. We have deacons. We're all priests, according to Peter. But... We don't have a head or whatever, you know, because Christ is the head of the church. You know, we have no need no other head. You know? So they had a little bit of the structure they were holding on to with Roman Catholicism and this. With this group, you had about 30 men and women. They were getting persecuted in Germany. So they went to England, and they continued to teach their doctrine there, um, believing prayer for the dead was useless. They preached against purgatory. And they also opposed the reverence of the saints. Um, this didn't go over real well in England, so they were branded with a hot iron for this. And then they were whipped in the streets of Oxford, and later they were just put to death. So, so because of their tendency to sell their good, they became known as the poor man to Leon. Uh, they actually had a lot of followers for this movement, and it, um, they... They, have, they were very humble folk. They, are, they were well known by their enemies, by the way they dressed their industry, the, the way they labored, the way they worked. They were different. They were noticeably different group. You know, they didn't go to taverns and dances. They were sober, truthful in speech. They avoided anger regarding accumulation as wealth and evil. This doesn't sound like a group that we should hate. This sounds like, you know, I may not agree with everything they're doing, but hey, those are good people by worldly standards. Yet, they were branded as heretics by the Roman Catholic Church and civil authorities, and they were sought to eliminate them. Uh, they tried to persuade them if possible, but then that didn't work. Then we got to eliminate them. So they sought refuge in the Italian Alps, and they show up again in the Reformation. And they actually still exist today, not in the same form or so forth. They've changed a little bit, but they're one of the Protestant groups that came out of the Reformation. They began before Reformation, and they still exist today. It would not have been great. It had probably been mostly um, Latin text, Latin Vulgate, because this is... Four, yeah, I'm trying to see if I have it. This is prior to Wycliffe. So, and Lord willing, next week we'll get into, we'll talk about him some. But he was really the first major individual who put the Bible into the common language, the common vernacular of the area. And so, they probably would not have had a wide acceptance to the scriptures um, they might have had co some copies of the Vulgate, but how accurate that is, I don't know. I, I think it was probably fairly accurate. So, so when we think about these groups we've talked about this morning, they have one thing in common. They all began within the Catholic Church, and there was no intention of leaving the Catholic Church. They wanted to improve it. They wanted to fix the problems within it. They did not want to leave it. They did not want to really um, start a new religion. 
They also have one thing in opposition. The first type of reforms began administered by the Roman Catholic Church itself, such as cleaning up the cleaning up the monastery issue. But the last type was reactionary. It began in opposition to Roman Catholic uh, desire and in defiance of what they wanted. But both groups did a lot in developing the Reformation ideal, um, and so this would really start setting the stage for other people to come on. Questions or comments about our lesson this morning? Well, Lord willing, we will be here next week, and then I think we'll probably be out for a couple weeks, and then when is Blaze? It's in November this year, isn't it? So we probably, we might have one or two more classes in October then. So the Lord willing, we'll be in here again next week. So thank you very much. Appreciate the comments.